this next guest is one who's very special to us. Uh, J'ai eu le grand plaisir de faire le pèlerinage avec lui et 11 autres personnes, uh, en, uh, 11 autres jeunes, 13 autres personnes, uh, en direction du 42e Conseil général à Terre-Neuve. He's a pretty extraordinary person in more ways than one. Ask him about his shoulder trick, it's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> he's got some crazy dance moves. Uh, one of them he invented goes like this. I think it's catching on. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> he's one of the kindest people we know. Um, he's our good friend. Please welcome. He's also my bae. <laughs> Please in, welcome. In a straight bromance way, but you know. Please welcome Aiden Lego. <laughs> Do you guys want to see the shoulder trick? Yeah. <laughs> I have a gift. <laughs> all right, first of all, has everyone got their observer hats? They're free. You should pick them up. I think they're in the, uh, the gathering room, the multi-purpose room, E-104, yeah. Okay, yeah, they're great. I love them. Okay. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Rendezvous is going well so far? Good. Um, so before we begin, I'd personally uh, like to recognize that the land on which we are gathered now uh, is the traditional territory of the Mohawk Nation. Uh, for thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans, uh, the Mohawk people and other nations thrived in this place, um, and for their stewardship of this territory, we are grateful. Uh, deuxièmement, uh, je veux dire que le français, ce n'est pas ma langue maternelle, um, et des fois j'ai de la difficulté à m'exprimer proprement en français et donner justice à mes mots uh, et à la beauté de la langue. Alors, uh, pour ce matin, je vais laisser uh, la tâche de la traduction au traducteur professionnel uh, mais si vous avez uh, des questions en français au fin de la présentation, s'il vous plaît, vous pouvez me les demander. Je ferai de mon mieux de les répondre. Alors, merci. So, I'd like to thank all of you for joining me this morning. Um, it's always amazing, as a young person, to go to National United Church events and see all of the bright and passionate and talented faces that are here uh, from across the country to share in communion with each other and with the church and with the Holy Spirit. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Aidan Legault. I'm a 20-year-old student of political science, religious studies, and French at Mount Allison University <laughs> in sunny Sackville, New Brunswick. And my home church is St. Peter's United in Sudbury, Ontario. In August of 2015, almost two years ago to the day, the United Church of Canada's 42nd General Council concluded in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. Some of us were here, oh, some of us here were there, I should say, yeah, yeah, GC42. That summer, like Sam was mentioning, I had the honor to be part of a pilgrimage of 13 youth from across the country who embarked on a, a journey across Canada from Vancouver to Cornerbrook, uh, and that journey ended at General Council. I know it's a cliche to say, uh, but that journey genuinely changed my life. Um, I saw things that I never otherwise would have been able to see. I met people that I never otherwise would have met. Um, and yeah, I was changed in ways that I never otherwise could have changed. It changed the way that I think about myself as a Christian and as a person who calls themselves a progressive in an increasingly polarized world. So yeah, if you get the chance, feel free to chat with me or any of the other pilgrims about that experience. Um, I know I would love to talk about it, and I'm sure they would as well. <laughs> I haven't asked them, but we're all big fans of what we did. So, yeah, if, if you see anybody who looks pilgrimy, uh, <laughs> feel free to ask them. I don't know, like buckles on their shoes or something. <laughs> um, so for those of you who may not know, I'll explain what I mean when I say general counsel. Um, so some of you will be intimately familiar with this spiel, so feel free to tune me out for the next couple minutes. Sing a hymn, something fun. Um, <laughs> So as things stand at the moment, the United Church of Canada is divided into different levels of administration. So pastoral charges and churches in smaller geographic areas will form presbyteries, 
And then those presbyteries come together to form larger geographic bodies called conferences, of which there are now 13. Uh, and then those conferences send delegates every three years to a meeting called the General Council, and those delegates will receive proposals that are brought to the table from all across the country, uh, from different pastoral charges, uh, conferences, and presbyteries, and they'll review that information, they'll debate on it, they'll discuss it, and at the General Council, they'll kind of set the policy and the platform and a lot of the different public positions of the church. Um, so, other than the General Council, too, there's this dedicated body of church wizards called the General Council Executive, <laughs> who works constantly behind the scenes to implement the decisions made at the General Council and to oversee the daily working of the church. Uh, so, I know this may not be the most interesting topic of conversation for people who aren't big church nerds, <laughs> um, but it's thanks to the tireless work of all of these people that we're here today. So, yeah, I think they've earned their shout out. Um, and if I got any of that wrong, by the way, um, feel free to talk badly of me behind my back to your friends, <laughs> or like, shame me silently or something like that, that's okay. Um, yeah, so while I was at General Council, uh, we pilgrims and many other youth from across Canada had the chance to participate alongside more seasoned United Church members as youth commissioners, uh, meaning that we could debate and vote on the proposals being brought forward, and it was a really profound honor to get to do that. Um, considering that the attendees of the council consisted of some of the wisest and most talented and most passionate lay people and clergy people from across Canada and beyond. Um, other attendees at the council included several former moderators. Our current moderator, the incredible Right Reverend Jordan Cantwell, who's I hope somewhere in the audience. <laughs> nice. Hi, Jordan. Um, <laughs> uh, as well as some First Nations elders from across Canada and hundreds of other talented and passionate people um, who have dedicated really their lives and decades and decades of work to building this institution that we cherish into what it is today. I, on the other hand, for perspective, have never lived in a world in which the movie Air Bud didn't exist. <laughs> so you can, you can imagine, <laughs> oh yeah, we got some Air Bud fans in the house, give it up. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you can imagine that my journey with Christ and with the church is a relatively recent undertaking. Um, but we can all be proud and happy to belong to a church which recognizes and deeply, deeply values uh, the voice that young people have and the power that we have as young people to help develop the identity of our united family. The pilgrimage and the 42nd General Council brought with them a lot of light for me and for many other people who were there. I left Cornerbrook in August with a renewed love of my church and the work that it does. Over the course of the summer, my friends and I had had the opportunity to travel across Canada and meet so many different people with different backgrounds, different beliefs, different stories, different practices. And yet, as, as this incredible united and uniting church, people are able to put aside that which separates them and come together to worship and to sing and to praise the maker with all that they do. And I think that that's something really incredible. And that's something that's on display today uh, and at General Council. So congratulations on that, everybody. So however an, uh, inspiring and moving General Council was, though, it has been hard to shake off a gloom of uncertainty that has surrounded us now uh, and then, not only as a church, but also as individuals. Uh, and citizens of a very troubling and troubled world. The decisions made by the General Council were challenging ones, and some of them may fundamentally change the shape of the church and the way that we do ministry. A lot of people are very worried about the future of the church, and they're right to be. It's a scary time as we're seeing church attendance decline and budgets get tighter. But if it's any comfort to anyone, my friends and I, we've seen the people who form this church, and so many of us are gathered here today. I can tell you with absolute certainty that there is a passionate love for humanity that burns in the heart of every churchgoer I have ever spoken to, those both young and old. The people of the United Church have changed Canada and have changed the world before, and I believe with all of my heart that across this country, whatever fate awaits this institution, there are people in cities, in towns, and in villages who will continue to preach the good news of God's unending love to the world until the end of time. <laughs> it, 
in them and in you the message and the spirit of our church, whatever it looks like in the future, and the message and the spirit of God, it will live forever. So that's you. That's on you. <laughs> so the general council also concluded amid controversy. Sorry, hats, hats have never been really flattering on me. <laughs> Put that there. <laughs> Um, some of the decisions made there have left people both inside and outside the church feeling frustrated, disappointed, and hurt. And it's that which I would like to speak about today. I'm here to talk to you as a young person, as a member of this community that we call the United Church of Canada, and as a member of a global community that seems, with every passing day, to be closer and closer to the precipice of crisis, that crisis that's economic, political, and moral. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is that thing that I think unites us most of all, which is, of course, the movie Air Bud. Am I right? I'm just kidding. No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. But what I would like to talk about today is Christ and silence. So to begin, I'd like to briefly mention two of the decisions that were made at the General Council uh, that have been among the most controversial uh, and give you a very brief and hopefully balanced idea of the issues at stake and why the General Council made the decisions that it did. So one of the choices made by the 42nd General Council was the decision to divest the church's investment holdings from the 200 largest publicly traded fossil fuel companies. So what that means is the church has uh, put in place a plan to ethically sell uh, almost $6 million worth of fossil fuel-based investments with the intention of investing that money into renewed energy sources. Well, <laughs> for many, the passage of this proposal was a source of celebration and an example of how we as a church can live into our vow to, as our creed puts it, live with respect in creation. For many others, however, this choice to publicly and deliberately take a stand against big oil and gas companies was a very painful one. The United Church is blessed to count among its members thousands of individuals and families who rely on fossil fuel uh, for their living. The United Church owes much to these members as they are often very distant from other settlements and the love and hospitality that they share with their communities in the name of our church is something that is completely invaluable. Um, yeah, so given the dedication that these members of our United Church family have to the work of the church and the fact that many oil and gas companies are in a state of financial instability resulting from uh, decreasing oil prices and, and just a very, very complex economic and political global climate, uh, this has resulted in layoffs and uncertainty for these companies and for the families who rely on these companies to make money and to be able to feed themselves. And given all of that, the General Council's decision to divest from fossil fuel companies felt like a very hurtful blow from an institution that is meant to unite and not to divide. The sadness that they feel is deeply valid, and we as a church must share their burden with them as the world moves into a time murky with uncertainty. But it's important for us also to bear in mind that the decision to divest from fossil fuels was not motivated by an intention to antagonize or to ostracize anyone, least of all the people who have given so much time and energy to our church. Our goal as a church is to move towards a just future in concert with, not in opposition to the families who are reliant on the fossil fuel industry. Climate change is a very real and very lethal threat to life as we know it and to life in general, and its effects are being felt across the world and in Canada. Every summer now, our prairies and our forests are catching fire, and soon we won't even think of that as an abnormality. That will just be summer weather, unless we find a way to put a stop to it now. So it's that which the movement towards divestment is meant to stand in opposition to, that degradation of our environment, and to the lives and dignity of the people who are uh, affected by that. This is not a, a movement that was in opposition to any of the good people who currently work in the oil sands, who are cherished and beloved by God as much as any of us. So there is reason to be hopeful that a just future may exist, a future that is just and plentiful and sustainable for everyone on the planet, because we're seeing the number of jobs in renewable energy industries growing each year. We're seeing that now two-thirds of Canada's electricity is being produced by renewable energy sources. And in 2016, governments from across the world signed on to the Paris Peace, uh, not Paris Peace, Paris Climate Change Accords with the uh, uh, intent of reducing carbon emissions and putting a cap on global warming. So many of us celebrate all of these initiatives, and that's great, but it's important for us to recognize as a church 
that there are members of our family who are very fearful about what the future holds. So if I may, I'd like to quote the incredible Reverend, right, re, 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 right Reverend Jordan Cantwell, <laughs> who with characteristic wisdom and compassion uh, spoke on behalf of the church. She said, whether you are celebrating the choice our church has made about fossil fuels or feel for the direction in which we are heading, may you know that you are not alone. And I think that that is such a beautiful way to phrase that because we are a united church. We stand together, we have always stood together and we will always stand together into the future. So if one of us is hurting, all of us are hurting. And we can do things together. Another controversial proposal that was passed by the General Council concerned the ongoing occupation of Palestine by the State of Israel. Following its foundation in 1948, there was significant hostility between Israel and its neighboring countries. Israel had been formed out of parts of what had once been the British Mandate of Palestine. So in 1948, borders were drawn so that some territory was allotted to the State of Israel and its citizens, many of whom were European Jews fleeing the destruction of the Holocaust. Other parts of that territory were allotted to Palestinians, which is the name that we use to refer to uh, the Arab inhabitants of the land uh, that became Israel, uh, who lived there among others. So uh, yeah, territories like the West Bank and East Jerusalem were allotted to Palestinians. Um, sorry. Many of Israel's neighbors refused and still refuse to recognize Israel as a legitimate state and helped and helped to fund and support militant groups in the Israel-Palestine region who sought to undermine Israel's sovereignty. In June of 1967, Israel was attacked in what would become known as the Six-Day War. Facing Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, Israel managed to accomplish several decisive victories, and when the conflict ended after less than a week, Israel had occupied much of the territory that had been originally intended for Palestinians, specifically the West Bank and East Jerusalem. The situation here is incredibly complex. Israel has continued to occupy that territory to, until this day, despite that occupation being considered illegal by international law. Terrorism and violence have become commonplace in the region, with Israel refusing to relinquish the territory and permitting and even allowing Israeli settlers to move on to Palestinian territory that Israel has no legal right to. In response, many Palestinian militant groups have dedicated themselves to completely eradicating the state of Israel and destroying its innocent civilians. When discussing this dilemma, it's important to recognize that both sides are suffering and have competing interests. Israel is, as a state, in a very vulnerable position, and many militant groups have, like I said, made it their mission to obliterate its people. Palestinians living in occupied territory are, according to UN reports, increasingly losing access to their land, their food, water, and democratic freedoms. <laughs> Civilian casualties on both sides are continuing to mount as rockets are fired and bombs are detonated in places like hospitals and schools. After significant debate by the 42nd General Council, it was decided that the church should develop and implement a strategy of ethical divestment from companies who derive monetary gain and financial gain from the continued occupation. So that means companies who are either constructing factories uh, on occupied land or people who are uh, using resources to kind of exacerbate this conflict. So this movement is a global movement known as the BDS movement, BDS standing for Boycott, Divest, and Sanctions. Similar strategies, as some of you may know, were used in the past to protest uh, the South African apartheid. The goal of the decision to lend support to the BDS movement was and is to put pressure on the government of Israel to end the continued occupation of the West Bank, with the belief that reconciliation between Israel and Palestine and a working out of a just solution can only occur once Israel and Palestine can mutually recognize each other's legitimacy and right to exist. The reception to this decision was justifiably mixed. Many within the United Church supported the choice to take action in protest of the, uh, protest, sorry, of the occupation, added some, as did some Jewish organizations, like independent Jewish voices. Many others, however, felt that the United Church's decision was inherently anti-Zionist, anti-Israel, and anti-Jewish, with the intention of delegitimizing and demonizing the state of Israel. That group included our own parliament, the government of Canada, uh, which in 2016 voted to officially condemn organizations that participated in the BDS movement. I speak for myself when I say this. I support the BDS campaign because I believe that it is my duty as a Christian and as a citizen of this planet to seek peace and to resist oppression. 
So long as Palestinians live under military occupation, peace is unachievable between Israel and Palestine, and Jewish children and Palestinian children will continue to die needlessly. I have a profound respect and admiration for the members of the nation of Israel, both those in the nation state of Israel and those in diaspora, because I share with them an understanding of God as the source and the power of love, of justice, of righteousness, and of compassion. And it is because of that that I seek, along with the church, a just solution for the conflict between Israel and Palestine. That being said, I recognize that this is a deeply nuanced issue and that there will be those who disagree with me. And that's all right. I hope that in the future all of us can cooperate so that we can try to come to a resolution for this conflict so that civilians will stop dying and people can live in peace. So, that was a lot, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hopefully, we're all roughly on the same page about why these particular difficult decisions were made by the United Church and what the reasoning of the General Council was. There is absolutely room for legitimate and fair debate on both of these issues, and no policy is perfect. However, what I would like to speak to tonight is something that has weighed on me for two years now since, since those decisions were made, and that is the tone of the conversation that has surrounded the criticisms of the United Church's action. Time and time again, in articles and in conversations, I have heard it brought up that the United Church of Canada has no place to speak on issues like climate change, or pipelines, or the ongoing occupation of Palestine, or anything too political. Now, as of 2016 and Parliament's decision, it seems that silence for the United Church is even becoming a matter of legislation. And that has stuck in my throat for two years, and I've been chewing over that for a long time now, and I'd like to share with you the words that I've come up with in, in response to that. The idea of a Christian church remaining silent in the face of injustice is frankly a contradictory statement. The idea of a Christian church remaining politically neutral is a contradiction. Jesus Christ, the founder of our faith, and the one that we seek to emulate both as an institution and as people, was the very furthest thing from politically neutral. Jesus Christ lived during a time of imperialistic militarism and oppression and was born into an empire in which the vast majority toiled endlessly to feed themselves and their family while the very wealthy lived in luxury and reaped the benefits of their labor, leading to a ballooning divide between the very wealthy and the very poor. Does that sound at all familiar to you? In the face of this unjust system, Jesus was not silent as he walked with and shared love with people that were broken and rejected, and cured lepers, the lame, and the blind, people deemed by the powerful to be unwanted and unloved by God. Jesus was not silent when, in the Gospel of Matthew, he climbed a mountainside and delivered the Beatitudes, proclaiming, Blessed are the poor, and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus was a revolutionary, a radical, someone who witnessed the oppression of the poor and of minorities at the hands of powerful people and stood up to civil and religious leaders alike with such a passionate fire that they killed him for it. How can we call ourselves followers of Christ's message today if we allow ourselves to stay quiet in a world so deeply riddled with evil, a world in which children starve to death daily because of our own nation's free market system, a world where multinational corporations that perpetuate transphobia and racism are welcomed at pride events, but queer and trans people of color are not. A world in which a man who has glorified sexual assault and condoned white supremacy sits in the highest office of the most powerful country on the planet. We are told that our voices are not wanted because we are a church. Friends, we cannot call ourselves a church that follows Christ's message unless we ignore these voices of cynicism, which come directly from those who need most to be criticized and fight publicly, radically, and unapologetically for that of which Christ taught us. I spoke today of two issues that we have been told to be silent on, but like Christ, we must seek as a people and as a church who cherish our faith to recognize and challenge all tyranny where and when we see it. Matthew 21 tells us that when Jesus entered the temple of Jerusalem on Easter and saw that it was full of money lenders and merchants, he furiously overturned the tables, casting them from the temple and proclaiming, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. 
At the time, the presence of the money changers and vendors selling sacrificial animals in the temples was part of a money-making system used by Anas, who was the high priest of Jerusalem, and who exploited the fact that when a Jew came to pray at the temple, as was required for all males during the festival of Passover, they had to exchange Roman currency for Jewish currency in order to buy approved sacrificial animals. Anas and the priesthood controlled this process and reaped exorbitant profits at the expense of their people. When Jesus cast these money changers and merchants from God's house, he was not simply doing so for religious reasons. He was making a powerful political statement that fundamentally challenged a system wherein the powerful take advantage of their position to reap benefit at the expense of the poor. It would be like a billionaire taking office today and legislating massive tax cuts for the 1% while slashing Medicaid and Medicare. If we wish to follow the example of Jesus of Nazareth, we must vocally and unapologetically challenge our own nation's neoliberal economic systems and policies whose complete deregulation of the markets has led to the rich becoming even more absurdly wealthy while the world's poor watch their food vanish and their wages stagnate. Those of us, those, there are those who would have us remain silent about this colossal affront to the justice to which God calls us. The prophet Ezekiel warns us of those who are like lions will tear at the world like its prey, devouring the people and taking treasures and precious things, those who are like wolves who would kill people and shed blood to make unjust gains. It's a hard reality to face, but we live in a time when just that is happening. Around the world, corporations and individuals, many of them Canadian, ravage the earth, poison people's water, steal people's land, and violate people's rights. How, what would God have us do in the face of such a system? Ezekiel tells us, speak. God commands Ezekiel to set his face against those who would do evil and to prophesize, to speak God's truth and share with people God's message of righteous justice. We must do the same. In the face of unjust tax and trade policies that impoverish the world and jeopardize the lives of millions, we must speak. It is so dangerously easy to allow ourselves to become complacent here in Canada and to tout our own government as a bastion of liberty and fairness and justice for all. Before we let our leaders off the hook, though, remember, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, will be marching tomorrow in Montreal's Pride Parade, and that's fantastic that, that our, our government is showing solidarity with the LGBTQ plus community. However, remember, our Prime Minister also agreed to sell $15 billion worth of weapons to the Saudi dictatorship, which many believe will use those weapons to kill homosexuals and murder civilians in the Yemen. Our government promises justice to indigenous relations, yet has not implemented the policies set out by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which was passed in 2007, and pushes to build pipelines through traditional indigenous territory without the consent of the people who live there. Our leaders signed the Paris Climate Change Accords, and yet continue to funnel public money and political support into industries that are quite literally rendering the earth uninhabitable, particularly for people in equatorial and tropical nations who have already been impoverished by, by global economic institutions that are controlled by wealthy and powerful countries like our own. Just because Canada's hypocrisy is well hidden does not mean that it doesn't exist, that it is not hurtful, and that it is not evil. Some of you may be thinking, this is all easy to say. Governance is hard and sometimes distasteful compromises have to be made in order to assure political and economic security. And if you're thinking that, you're right. Governance is a very difficult thing to do. And it is precisely for that reason that our church cannot remain silent about these political issues. It is our duty to remind our governors, as Christ did, that treating people as commodities is wrong. Grinding the poor into the dust in the name of monetary profit is wrong. Participating in imperialistic warfare is wrong, and no amount of Canadian politeness can change that. So, what can we do? I often see how good we've become as a church and as church members at showing kindness and love to those around us. And it is a beautiful and endlessly important thing for our churches to serve as places of shelter and welcoming to those who need that. However, 
we want to live into the ministry of Christ, we have to go further. Kind actions alone will not end people's suffering forever. I love performing random acts of kindness as much as the next kid. They're a great way to show that you love your community and the people around you, but random acts of kindness alone will not put an end to discrimination. It's great to give to charity. That's an amazing way to give back to your community again and, and to do your part as a member of the world, but charity alone will not put an end to people's hunger. As the book of James puts it, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. The only way that we as people of faith can strive to put an end to the evils of our world is by doing as Jesus did and standing as champions for justice vocally taking action and challenging those governments and economic institutions that impoverish and bleed the world. In the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It sees that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. As a church, we must vocally stand in solidarity with marginalized people in our own country and around the world. We must do the same as individuals and lend our time, our talents, and our energy to making a difference. Write letters to your representatives in government, making clear your desire for justice in the world. Spend your money ethically. Educate yourself and your friends about issues like climate change, bigotry, unethical capitalism, and support and work with those fighting for improved public education, public health care, and the rights of women, people of color, our indigenous relations, the poor, immigrants, and the LGBTIQ plus community, to name but a few. Our generation in particular does not have the luxury of silence. The Earth's resources are dwindling, and as a result, violence is exploding in vulnerable areas. Our actions today will not only decide the nature of the world into which we raise our children and our children's children, but also the world into which we will live as adults. I'm reminded of one of Jesus' most famous parables. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him, and he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Jesus himself tells us that the person in that story who is doing God's work is the person who stops on the side of the road to help the stranger, though he has no reason to but the love in his heart and his knowledge of that which is right and that which is wrong. Friends, our world right now is like that man on the side of the road. For years now, people around the world have been stripped of their dignity, their property, their employment, and their very lives. How can we call ourselves a Christian church if we acknowledge this pain but pass by on the other side of the road? If we see suffering but keep our mouths closed? We must do as Christ and God would have us do and bandage our hurting world with our compassion, our love, our mercy, and with our defiant voices. I know that as young people, it's often difficult to speak to our friends and our neighbors about what it is that we do as a church, because Christians are so often considered by those who don't know the work of our congregations, considered synonymous with hypocrisy, bigotry, homophobia, misogyny. I implore you, though, for the sake of our world, for the sake of our church, for the sake of our children, speak boldly. Preach to the people around you a message of unstoppable and unshakable compassion, justice, and activism. Together, let us remind this nation and this planet that God is love, God is justice, and God is very much alive in all of us today. Thanks be to God.
Okay, I think, I think we have time for a very brief Q&A. Um, so I can take, I think, three questions. Are there people who have microphones that could run around? Anyone? Nice. Any questions? Hi, Mom. <laughs> Aiden, in a world where it's really hard to sort out truth from lies in the media, how do you suggest the average person educate themselves? Where are good resources to go to? Because you, you, your generation know how to use uh, tools that some of us don't who are older. That's a really, really great question. Um, yeah, so um, I have the uh, enormous luxury of being a university student. Um, so I live in a community where I'm able to talk to people who have great knowledge on these subjects, um, and that's been a real blessing for me. Um, but for other people, a great resource would be something like the internet. If you want to learn more about injustice, there are great resources on there. And I think what's most important when, when talking about this justice work is hearing the voices of the people who are affected by injustice themselves. I think that those are the most honest and genuine critiques of an unfair system. So, and we're very lucky here with the United Church. We've had the opportunity this week to speak to many people who, who have faced injustice. Um, Paula yesterday, for example, um, is, is an amazing voice for, for justice work in South and Central America um, because she's had that experience. She knows about it. So I would say look online, see if you can find resources like that or have conversations with people. Go to workshops, uh, attend church events like this and you'll be able to learn more about what people are going through around the world and what we can do as, as people to change that. I hope that, that's a, a reasonable answer. Hello, my name is Safaf, it's me again. Hi. Hi. Uh, my question is, where I came from is Sudan North, Nuba Mountain, and now they've been going through crisis for since 2011, my mom, she's still there, my siblings. I guess I want to reach out people to know what's going on in North Sudan right now. Every day, every minute, people are dying. My mom, now I talked to her a month ago, now they run out of salt. They don't have her salt anymore. They're using uh, kind of herbs. They have a test for salt. And the way you talk about what's going on in the world, really, I want everybody to know how people go through lives every single day. And the day I came here at Ten How, I see the food going to the garbage. I cry inside my heart. People, they don't have their even one, one even chicken or a month, they don't have. Mostly now in Nuba Mountain, the animals now, they are gone. A few just left. People, they have to hunt them for rats, rabbits, or any kinds just to have a protein. And what do you say is employ yourself? What do you can do? for other people. Please, can you employ me? So, uh, the, w w was the question, what can we do, or? Um, well, my, my understanding of how to best address those situations is, is, is stand in solidarity with organizations that are working um, in areas that are, that are suffering enormously. So, um, I, I think that giving your support to organizations like Doctors Without Borders or the Red Cross. Th those are great organizations that we know are working ethically I in conflict-prone regions or, or areas that are in conflict right now and where people are genuinely suffering. So thank you for sharing that with us. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you for being here. One more. We've got, we've got time for one more question. Hi. 
Hi. All the way up here. So my question is, is where do you get your main source of information? Because you talked about a wide variety of issues. And also as a ally, how do you feel, um, how do you, pr sorry, how do I rephrase this? How do you prioritize voices of differently gendered people and people of visible minority? That's, yeah, that's a great question. It's a really difficult question to answer. Um, so, uh, like I was saying, I, I have the uh, enormous like, pleasure and, and luxury of being able to go to a university. Um, and a lot of my information comes from uh, the work that's done there, from my professors, um, from my friends who are really heavily involved in activism work, and then from my own readings and research and things like that that I do for projects. So studying in a field like political science, you do have to do a lot of readings on, on these subjects. And I've also studied macroeconomics and global finance and things like that. So a lot of my information does come from that. Um, your question about how to um, really put forward the voices of people who are differently gendered, uh, was that the question? Yeah, um, so letting people speak. Yeah, how do you use your privilege for good? That's a, that's a great way, yeah. Um, so oftentimes the best way to do that is um, a, as a white male ally, closing your mouth um, and in groups letting people, <laughs> and I know I'm doing, I'm doing a really <laughs> bad job of that right now because I was asked to speak here, I, I apologize. <laughs> um, but yeah, keep closing your mouth and letting people who, who are often not heard be heard. Um, and the other thing that you can do is if you hear people making comments or making jokes that are, are making other people unsafe, whether or not it's in that moment or generally creating an atmosphere and a world that is unsafe, call them out on it. If you are, are in a position where, where you are safe to be able to make those statements because you're not going to be judged or targeted because of it, and oftentimes that's the, the situation that white people and men are in, then yeah, raise your voice. Comment when people make misogynistic jokes or homophobic jokes or transphobic jokes, um, or just comments that you know are wrong. Uh, like I was saying, we're told to prophesize, to speak and, and to share God's truth, and God's truth is one that all people are valued, beloved, and equal. Um, and it's our job to say that, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so some arguments I hear against uh, helping out other people um, is that we need to help ourselves a lot more, mm -hmm. is that we should really focus on helping ourselves before we help others. And it's like, what would you say to people who are like, we need to prioritize ourselves like, before we help anyone else? Well, um, I think Roger, uh, if I can call him by his first name, I'm sorry if you're in the building and that's <laughs> rude, I'm sorry. Uh, he, made, he made a really, really great point yesterday that if you, if you look at the clothes that you're wearing, as he said, we are wearing the world right now. You know, we, we don't exist in a time where countries exist separately from each other. Um, the things that are happening across the, the ocean right now are going to affect what happens here in Canada. So if somebody says we need to put Canada first or we need to put America first, remind them that what is good for China, what is good for Egypt, what is good for Great Britain, is good for the world. When people are suffering in the world, we're all going to suffer, and that's inevitable. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thanks very much, everybody.